want to finish up this uh, series here, short one on Micah 4, 1 through 7. Last time we made it through the first three verses, and this time we're going to make it through uh, the remaining four, Lord willing. And just to recap what we covered last week, I'm just going to step through this very briefly. In verse 1, we saw that in the last days it would come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord would be established in the mountains. And I showed you that the last days were the first century and that the mountain of the house of the Lord was the kingdom of God, the church, the New Testament church that Christ built that became this great mountain that we read about in Daniel chapter 2. It was exalted above the hills and people shall flow into it, it says. And that was the Jews came into it from all over the place, uh, all, nations, all nations under heaven in, in Acts chapter 2. You had 3,000 added there right at the very beginning and then thousands after that. Then verse 2, many nations shall come and uh, go up to the house of the Lord and be taught his ways and walk in his paths. That was the Gentiles, many nations coming into the church, learning the gospel, learning uh, the ways of the Lord to follow. And then it says there that the law would go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Uh, Zion and Jerusalem are the church, the New Testament church, and the law went forth from there, from the mouths and the hands of the apostles whenever they uh, preached and then wrote down the New Testament scriptures. In verse 3, he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. So the gospel goes out and it commands men to repent, rebukes nations. The Gentiles that come into the church beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. They learn to do violence no more. Their old ways are reformed. They're no longer uh, violent sinners and there's no animosity between Jews and Gentiles anymore. In the church, Jews and Gentiles are made at peace with each other. The middle wall of partitions broken down. The enmity has been slain and they are now all one in Christ Jesus. And that brings us to verse 4. Malachi 4 and verse 4. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. So this is spoken in connection with verse 3, which said that they would beat their swords into plowshares, right? They're not going to be learning war anymore. Contrarily, they are going to be sitting under their vine and their fig tree. So let's look at that first phrase there. Now, if you think about it, a vine and a fig tree are both fruit-bearing trees, right? Didn't say they were going to sit under their oak and their maple, but under the vine and the fig tree. Vines produce grapes, fig trees produced, you guessed it, figs, right? So these are both fruits that uh, sustain man, man's life. So rather than being at war, the converted among the nations that are coming into the house of the Lord, they're going to find their sustenance from God. Instead of destroying and being, you know, warring people now, they are going to come and have rest and peace and enjoy provision from God. And this is what Jesus taught us to do in Matthew six thirty one through 33. When you're finally converted and you come into the church and you're not trying to go out there and save yourself anymore or save the world and um, trying to keep up with all of the horrible burdens that the religious world puts on you or trying to deal with the results and the, the judgments of your own sins, you can actually find rest. You can, you can sit down. You can take a break. You can be nourished then by Christ, and that's what's happening here. They're sitting under their vine and under their fig tree. Uh, Matthew six thirty one through 33. Jesus said, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, but your heavenly fa or for your heavenly, your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? They're going to be added unto you. You're going to be sitting underneath your fig tree, underneath your vine, and being provided for by the Lord. Uh, Paul said in Philippians 4 and verse 19 that his God would supply all of our need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. This book was written to Philippians. 
Philippians was a church in Philippi, right? This is a Gentile church. So here Paul is writing to Gentiles, you know, these people that came into the house of the Lord from all nations, and they're going to be sitting under their fig tree and under their vine. And he writes to these Gentiles who now have found rest in Christ, and he tells them that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. They would find rest, right? I want you to notice there, it says that they, it doesn't say they will be standing underneath their oak tree. It says they shall be sit, they will, they shall sit underneath his vine and his fig tree. They're going to be sitting. And what does sitting denote? Rest, right? They're not running. They're not walking. They're not standing. They're not climbing. They're sitting, right? They're resting. Look at Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30. This is what happens whenever we come unto Christ and are added to his church. We find rest. Matthew 28, Matthew 11, pardon me, Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There's a lot of people that are in various so-called Christian churches, and their burden is anything but easy and light. You know, from anything from running five nights a week to all these various functions that are always going on, to food drives and feeding the poor and, and whatever else they have going on, which, you know, I'm not saying any of those things are necessarily wrong in and of themselves, but they are kept running constantly, so they're not finding rest there. Then these same churches will put a lot of them will put this burden on you that number one you might not you might not even be saved because you you might not have actually prayed the prayer right or you might not maybe you're not living quite right or you're not continuing in the good works and therefore you're not saved so you always have to worry about being saved and then you have to worry if maybe I didn't do it right the first time maybe I should do it again and then they put the burden of not only your own salvation on your shoulders but then the burden of everybody else's salvation that you might happen to come into contact or even people that you might not come into contact with because you're not out there trying to save them. And then if, if they're on the other side of the planet, you're not giving money to missionaries to go save them, right? So you get all this, I mean, you got the world on your shoulders. They're basically making you Jesus Christ and you got to save the world here. And that's not exactly what I would consider a restful Christianity, a restful religion. Um, constant burdens being placed on you. And then if it's not that, it's a whole bunch of thou shalts and thou shalt nots that aren't in the Bible, where you have all these extra rules that you have to keep that, that God never commanded you to keep, dietary laws and, and you know, who knows what else, you know, strict dress codes that go far beyond what the Bible ever you know, commands, and all those kind of things. So most churches, I shouldn't say most, but there's a lot of churches out there where there's not much rest. But that's not the case in the true church. You should find rest. And if you don't have rest, then re-examine some things because you should have rest. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that have labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. So if you don't have spiritual rest in your soul, there's, there's something wrong. They that believe, we're told in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 3, enter into rest. You see, there was not much rest in the Old Testament religion. There was sacrifices that had to be kept up every day, morning and evening, and and there was never and and those sacrifices never took away sins. There was a constant remembrance of sins made every year. Every year, those, those the high priest would go in there and make the sacrifice for the people. They were not resting, but when Christ came, we realized that the work is done. When He said it is finished, that's what He meant. It's finished, not it started, like most people think. It's finished. It's over. He has saved his people from their sins. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 3 says, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So when we believe, we enter into rest. And that's what's happening here with these, um, these people here in Micah. Four in verse four, they are sitting under their fig tree and under their vine, resting. And then the second half of that verse says, "And none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it." So, 
not only are they brought to rest, but then they also have their they have their fears removed. They no longer have a fear of man. Look at Matthew 10 and verse 28. I've talked about this just recently. I think when I was talking about the, well, maybe it was might have been I don't know, it was last week or it was it was recently in a sermon anyway. I was talking about how Christianity brought down the Roman Empire. I think it was last Sunday, and how the Caesar once people realized that Jesus is Lord and that Caesar is just a man and he doesn't have the power of my eternal destiny in his hand, um, then at that point there's no more. You don't have to fear him. Right, because the worst he can do is kill you, and and okay, big deal. I get to go to heaven. Right, there's the, there's nothing he can do after he kills me, and this is what freed people from the stranglehold of the Roman Catholic Church too, because the Roman Catholic Church is basically the Roman Empire rebuilt or transitioned, transformed. Um, they even took all the a lot of the names. The Pope is called the Pontifex Maximus. That was Caesar's title. Right, they didn't just come up with that. They certainly didn't find it in the Bible. They just took Caesar's title and gave it to the Pope. And that's the whole Catholic religion, taking Rome and all of their customs and traditions and bringing them into the Catholic Church, Christmas, Easter, Halloween, all the the holidays and all that kind of stuff. Uh, The prayers for the dead and the the incense and the candles and all that stuff. It's all a bunch of, it's all paganism. I, I think I talked about that in the Satan series when we talked about the Catholic Church. But anyway, um, when you're when you're delivered from that, and you're in the true church, then you don't have to fear man anymore. No guy has has the power of your eternal life uh, in his power. Matthew 10 and verse 28. You'd think after all that talking, I would have got there. I only made it back to Matthew 19 and then got distracted by myself. Uh, Matthew 10, 28 says, And fear, Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You see, men can only kill the body. They can't kill the soul because the soul is immortal. The soul never dies. Right? That's why when it goes to hell, it's tormented forever and ever. It never dies. God is able, after he kills the body, then to destroy both soul and body in hell. But Caesar is not able to do that. The Pope's not able to do that. Donald Trump's not able to do that, even though he is the chosen one. No man is able to do that. Now, there are also these people, these Gentiles and Jews, for that matter, that came into the church. They were delivered from the fear of man and from the fear of death. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 2, 14 through 15. Even if you didn't think some man had the power of your eternal destiny in his hands... If you don't know what's going to happen to you after death, that's a scary thing, right? A lot of people are are fearful of that. And I think that a lot of people, they probably trick themselves into being atheists. They don't like the idea of of possibly being judged after death. So just to make sure in their own minds, the the self-deception going on, they convince themselves that there is no God. Whether they deep down believe it or not, many of them, they might have doubts themselves. There have been atheists on their deathbeds that were scared to death. And I'm trying to think. I can't remember the guy's name. Um, he was a real hardcore um, antagonistic person towards God, and I don't remember which one he was. But anyway, that guy was scared to death on his deathbed. And I'm sure it's happened to not a few of them. But once you realize that Jesus Christ has conquered death, that he saved you from your sins and taken away the punishment of those sins and that you're not going to be judged after death, then that fear of death should evaporate. Hebrews chapter 2, 14 through 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might, de- might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You talk about being in chains. If you're afraid to die and afraid of what's going to happen when you die, that's like the sword of Damocles hanging over your head your whole life. You're always worried about what's going to happen. But Christians don't have to worry about that. That brings us to verse 5, Malachi 4 and verse 5. 
Micah, thank you. Twice. I've done it twice already. I don't know why. I don't know why I do that. Thank you. Micah, not Malachi. Somebody brought that to my attention last time. Micah. Let's see if I can get through the rest of it without saying the wrong book again. Okay, in Matthew 4, 5. Just kidding. Okay, you didn't even catch that. See, you weren't even paying attention. Micah 4, 5. If I could find it, where is it? See, there we go. Micah 4 and verse 5. For all people will walk, every one, in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Now, if you maybe you know, grew up in dispensationalism or something, and maybe you read this passage and think, well, maybe it is talking about some future era, you know, long, long after... Um, Christ came, and maybe there is some some special blessing that he has, and he's going to set up some, you know, the house of the Lord in the mountains, and and it's going to be this great time when everybody comes into, and it's going to be this, you know, one one world religion that should maybe make you pause if you think about that. But anyway, maybe you thought, well, maybe this is really speaking of, of the millennium at the end of time. This verse five should should really put the kibosh on that, because notice what it says there. For all people will walk everyone in the name of his God, and that's a lowercase g, God, okay? So that should tell us that this is not referring to some millennium, some thousand-year period where the whole world is converted, right? And everybody is, is, uh, you know, under the lordship of Jesus Christ, and they're all living righteously. No, it says every man's going to walk in the name of his own God. So what does that mean? How can this be? How can that be happening in what I'm describing here in the creation of the New Testament church? Well, you know, there was a lot of people that were brought into the church, but there was even more people that were not brought into the church, right? There were plenty of people that were not converted. And the unconverted people of the Gentiles, they continued to follow their false gods. And I'll just show you that the, the, the Gentiles, whenever they were doing their pagan religion, and whether they were worshiping the earth or the sun or the moon or the seasons or whatever they're worshiping, they're really worshiping false gods. They're worshiping the devil. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 20. Paul says, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, see, saying this in the present tense, there are still Gentiles out there, of whom these Corinthians used to be, those Gentiles, I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. So the other Gentiles among these Corinthians who are not converted, they are, they were sacrificing to devils. They were walking every man in the name of his own God. The Bible says that there be Lord's many and God's many, right? There are many gods. Of course, they're all false gods and they're not actual real beings, but they are devils, right, that are, that are masquerading as these false gods that these Gentiles are uh, worshiping and sacrificing to. See, many of the Gentiles that heard the gospel, they rejected it, and they continued to walk in their own ways. And I want you to notice that word walk. Remember in Malik, Micah, Micah 4, 5, for all people will walk everyone in the name of his God. I want you to notice this. I'm going to, I'm going to draw your attention to this, this word walk here. Let's look at Acts chapter 14 and verse 16. Before the gospel came to these Gentiles, they were walking in their own ways. Acts 14 and verse 16. Paul here is he's preaching to some unconverted heathen. And he says, Who in times past, he's speaking of the Lord, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Okay, so they're walking in their own ways. They're walking in the name of their own gods. And when the gospel comes, some of them reject it and they continue to walk in the ways of their own gods. And some of them 
then continue, some of them turn and, and walk in the way of the Lord. We'll look at that in just a second. Uh, Acts 17, verses 29 through 32. Paul here again is preaching to heathen. This time he's in Greece. He's on Mars Hill right there in Athens. And he's preaching to the philosophers. Verse 29, he says, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead." And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. See, they're still walking in the ways of their God. Right? They're, not, they're not convinced. And others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. You see, they are no longer going to be walking in the way of their own God. But plenty did. Then let's get the second half of Micah 5 and verse 4. Micah got the name right that time, got the chapter wrong. I can't get anything right. Micah 4, 5, the second half of the verse. And we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Okay, so on one hand, you have these unconverted Gentiles that are walking in the name of their God. But on the other hand, you have the faithful among, the, among Israel, among the Jews, and the faithful among the Gentiles that are walking in the name of the Lord our God. Let's look at, at uh, Galatians 6 verses 15 and 16. And I want you to notice again that word walk. In Micah 4, 5, it says, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God. I want to show you the fulfillment of this in Galatians six fifteen through 16. Paul says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. So here you have the Israel of God, elect Jews, and elect Gentiles, because remember, circumcision doesn't matter, uncircumcision doesn't matter. So we're not just talking about Jews here when it says the Israel of God. We're talking about elect Jews and Gentiles, whether they're circumcised or not. They are walking in the ways of the Lord. Just like Micah said in Micah 4 and verse 5. Let me just give you a couple of more verses. Uh, Colossians 2 and verse 6. Show you a fulfillment of this text. We will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Colossians 2 and verse 6. Paul says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so Walk ye in him. There you go, right? We will walk in the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, in this case, our God, forever and ever. I'll give you one more. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 12. So you don't have to go to some future millennium to see Gentiles walking after their gods and the Israel of God walking after the Lord their God. Right? You don't have to go to a millennium to see that. You don't have to go to you know, 3,000 years future. You've got to go right to the first century when the New Testament is written. And here it all is right before your eyes, if you'll just believe it. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 12. Paul says that, we, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom in glory walking in the way of the Lord our God. Now, Christians in the church walk in newness of life. There's that word again. Look in Romans 6 and verse 4. Romans 6 and verse 4. It says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So there you have baptism. And how do you get into the church? Through baptism, right? Acts chapter 2. When they heard these things, they were pricked in their hearts, said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized. And then they were added to the church the same day. We read later. 
So they're baptized, and when you're baptized, then what do you do? Walk in newness of life. Walk in the name of the Lord your God. And we no longer walk in the ways that the other Gentiles walk after their own gods. Let's just tie this all together here with Ephesians 4 and verse 17. Ephesians 4 and verse 17. I hope this is making sense. I know I'm doing a lot of comparing Scripture, but I keep trying to tie it back to Micah. So I hope it's making sense anyway. Ephesians 4 and verse 17 says, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth, from here forward, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Right? Those other Gentiles are walking every man in the name of his God. Paul says, don't be walking in the names of those gods anymore. Walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Just like Micah said. All right, that takes us down to Micah 4 and verse 6. Micah 4 and verse 6. It says, In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. In that day, so in the time that he's talking about here, and we've already identified that as the first century, uh, whenever after Christ came and established the church and sent the apostles out to preach the word and people, Jews and Gentiles are coming into the church. In that day, saith the Lord, he will assemble her that halteth and gather her that is driven out and that he has afflicted. Now, what might this be talking about? Well, I don't think it would probably take a whole lot of thinking to, to realize that this is referring to his people Israel. His people Israel, God's people had been halting they had been afflicted, driven out. They had been driven out all over the world, really. You remember on the day of Pentecost, when Jews were there from 16 nations under heaven, how did they get to those 16 nations? Why, why weren't they all in Israel to begin with? Well, you remember when the Babylonians destroyed Israel under Nebuchadnezzar? I showed you this, um, was it in the Satan study? I, I can't remember what study it was. It wasn't all that long ago where I showed you that in the Babylonian captivity, they were scattered, the Jews were scattered in all, all over the world, all nations in the known world at that time. Now I wish I could remember what, what study that was, but I think it was in the, maybe it was in the Preter, I don't know. It was in one of, the, one of these studies anyway. I, I can't get mad at you if you can't remember my sermons. I can't remember them either. I remember what I said. I just can't remember which one I said it in. But anyway, um, so the point is, the people of Israel were driven out. They were, they were scattered all over the place. Peter, remember the apostle to the circumcision, to the Jews, he writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Bithynia, Asia, and so on. The Jews were scattered all over the place. Right? They had been driven out and afflicted, and they were halting. They were, they were in bad shape. And Jesus came at that time, to his estranged people and gathered them together. Let me just show you this, uh, Matthew 4 and verse 16. I want to show you a people here that were halting whenever Christ came. Matthew 4 and verse 16. That's kind of, halt is an old word. It's, it doesn't mean to, to, to pause like we think today, but halt like you're, you're um, crippled, you're stumbling. And it, it refers to people that were halting, or they, were, they weren't able to get around very well. Uh, Matthew 4 and verse 16, this is the fulfillment of, the, of a prophecy that Christ fulfilled. It says, The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region of the shadow of death, light is sprung up. They sat in darkness. This is referring to, to God's own people, to the Jews, that at this time were in a very dark and dismal state. Israel was in a really, really bad place when Christ came. And I don't think sometimes we realize that, but whenever you, you can certainly get hints of it. I mean, you remember in the Satan study, whenever we looked at whenever Christ came, how, how Israel was just full of devil possession all over the place and all these sick people and all this affliction. 
And then you look at, when you start reading your history books or read through Josephus, and you realize that the first century, it was no Sunday school picnic. I mean, they, they, the Israel was in bad shape. They were under the thumb of Rome. They had jerks like Pilate reigning over them that were mingling their blood, right? The, the Galileans that he mingled their blood with the sacrifices. We read about that in Luke 13. And there were insurrections and all kinds of stuff. It was not a, not a pleasant place to be in those days. And, and it was a dark spot. And Christ comes and he assembles her that halteth. He came unto his own afflicted people. You remember in John chapter 1 and verse 11, it says he came unto his own and his own received him not. In Matthew 15, 24, he said that he was come unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15 and verse 24. But he answered, this is, this is to the woman there, the Canaanite woman that... Um, wanted him to heal, was it her, her, uh, her daughter, grievously vexed with the devil, he wanted her to heal her. And in verse, four, in verse 24, it says, But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he goes to his afflicted, driven out people, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and he's going to assemble them, to gather them, to bring them into the fold. He came to comfort them. Look at Isaiah 40 in verses uh, 1 through 5. Isaiah 40, 1 through 5. I did a Bible study on Isaiah 40 here a few years ago. Spent it, what, probably at least six months or, or more on it. I don't remember. It was a long, long series. Uh, Isaiah 40, 1 through 5. This is a prophecy of the coming of Christ, the coming of John the Baptist who announced the coming of Christ. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. This is a prophecy of the coming of Christ. We know that because the next verse says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. This is speaking of John the Baptist. And what does God say to them? Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Her warfare is accomplished. Remember the remember what we've been looking at here in Micah? They would beat their swords into plowshares. Their warfare is accomplished. Christ took away the enmity between his people and God. There's no more warfare anymore. That really ties in there quite well. Verse 3, Isaiah 43, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Remember, Jesus is the glory of the Lord, right? And we beheld his glory as of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, John 1:14. So this is definitely, absolutely, without a doubt, a prophecy of Christ. And he came to comfort his people. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. His afflicted, driven out, halted people, he comes to bring them a message of comfort. Look at Luke 2, 25 through 32. See, it doesn't have to be at the end of time whenever Israel's been dispersed among the nations and then God comes back and gathers them into the land or something like people think has happened now. No, God did this 2,000 years ago to his people. Luke 2, 25 through 32. You see, you have an excuse for not understanding prophecy before it's fulfilled. But when it's been fulfilled, you don't really have an excuse anymore to look back at at prophecies like this and say, oh, well, that's still talking about the future when it's obviously clearly been fulfilled in the New Testament church. Luke 2, 25 through 32. This is right after Christ was born and they had taken him to the temple and presented him there and offered the sacrifices that, that were necessary under the law whenever a baby boy was born. And in verse 25, it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. 
And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, he took him up into his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Notice what he was waiting for there in verse 25. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And he saw the consolation of Israel, the birth of Jesus Christ, who would save his people from their sins. That was the consolation of Israel. Consolation is the act of consoling, cheering, or comforting, the state of being consoled, alleviation of sorrow or mental distress. God would come to his halting, driven out, and afflicted people and comfort them and offer them consolation, which is exactly what Jesus Christ did when he came. He visited them, he redeemed them, and he delivered them from their enemies. Look at Luke 1, 68-69. This is the prophecy that Zechariah, the, the father of John the Baptist, gave after he received his speech back. Luke 1, 68 and 69. He says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Referring to the birth of Christ, of course. And then look at uh, verse 74. This is still part of his, his uh, prophecy here. That he would grant unto us that we being delivered from out, or out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Christ would deliver them from their enemies. Not in the way that they thought. Right? They thought that he was going to restore Israel to the way it was in the days of Solomon. But he delivered them from their enemies. From the chief enemy, that is the devil, who had kept, kept them in bondage. He gave them the freedom, the liberty that is in Christ, no longer in bondage. Jesus said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John chapter 8, 31 and 32, I think it is. The Lord called those people to repentance. Mark 1, 14 through 15. So he sends the Lord Jesus Christ to his afflicted, halted people, and he calls them to repentance. I'm going somewhere with this, so just keep following me. Mark, 14, Mark 1, 14 through 15. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So he calls them to repentance in connection with the kingdom of God being at hand, right? We saw that last time. Now, remember what the prophecy said there in Micah 4, 6. He said, I will assemble her that halteth. I will gather her that is driven out. Well, he gathered them into his church, at least those that would come. Let me show you this. Look in uh, Genesis. We're going to go way back. We're going to go to an even older prophecy to understand this newer prophecy in Micah. Go to Genesis 49. In verse 10, you remember what after Jesus rose from the dead and he did a little Bible study with those men in the road to Emmaus and he opened their scriptures and he showed them in, in the prophets, the law, the prophets and the Psalms, all the things concerning him. See, in all the books of the Bible, the whole way back from Genesis chapter 3, almost at the very beginning, there was the first prophecy of Christ, right, that the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head and, and the serpent would bruise his heel. And then here, later on in the book of Genesis, here is another prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Genesis 49 and verse 10, it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall be the gathering of, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. That's a prophecy of Christ. He was 
of the tribe of Judah. He had the scepter of Judah. He was the king of the Jews, right? And it says, And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. He would gather her that is driven out, as Micah said, Micah 4 and verse 6, and that he had afflicted. Look at Matthew 23. Matthew chapter 23. And we'll look at verse 37. This verse shows us the intent that Jesus had, and we can see by implication that he did gather some. He just didn't gather all that he wanted to gather. He wanted to gather all of his children, all of the elect Jews, and many of them would not. They would not be gathered. But the ones that would, he gathered them in. Matthew 23 and verse 37. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together. There it is. I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. He wanted to gather his people under his wings. Many of them rejected him. They wouldn't be gathered. They didn't want to be under the shadow of the wing of the Almighty, as we read about in, um, is that in Psalm 91, I think it is. But obviously, his disciples, his early church, he did gather them under his wing, right? He did that. They came. Look at John chapter 11. John eleven fifty through 52. Now, some of them at the time were not going to be gathered. But later on they were, and we'll talk about that in just a second. John eleven fifty through 52. This is Caiaphas, the high priest, speaking, actually under, under inspiration of God. He was prophesying, but he didn't really know what he was saying. He, he, was, he was saying one thing, where the words he was saying were true, but what he meant by those words was something altogether different. But what he actually said was, was absolutely true. God can do that sometimes. Of course, I mean, he, he does do it sometimes. Balaam, think about Balaam wanted to curse Israel and out of his mouth comes a blessing to Israel and he didn't want to say it, but he, he said it because God made him say it. John eleven fifty through 52. Caiaphas says, Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. See, so he's saying, if, if Jesus dies, if we kill this guy, then the nation's not going to perish at the hand of the Romans. There's not going to be some great uprising to make Jesus the king, and the Romans aren't going to come in and squash us, right? That's what Caiaphas is thinking. Verse 51, And this he spake not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that he should also gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. He gathered them in one. He brought, and Caiaphas, of course, didn't have a clue about this, but not only did he gather the elect of that nation into the church, he gathered um, the children of God that were scattered abroad. So Jesus said, Other sheep have I that are not of this fold in John chapter 10. He had other sheep outside of the nation of Israel, and once the gospel went to the Gentiles, they were gathered into his church as well. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. I'm going to show you how, how the people, through the preaching of the word and through repentance, are gathered into his church. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 it says, for, what, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. That's what happens whenever the gospel's preached and men are baptized. And if we're all baptized into one body, what have we been but gathered into one body, right? Congregated together. That's what a church is. It is a congregation, a gathering of people. And these, these people here, the Jews and the Gentiles as well, but we're 
speaking particularly of the Jews because we're talking about his afflicted and halted and driven out people. They were assembled unto him in his church after they rejected him. Let's look at Acts chapter 2, Acts 2, 37 through 42. And I have another verse here that I will add, which will really cinch this one up. Acts chapter 2, 37 through 42. Remember, just stay in Acts. But in, in Micah, he said, I will assemble her that halteth. Okay, so Acts chapter 2, 37 through 42. Now when they heard this, this is the Jews on the day of Pentecost, heard Peter preaching about how they were responsible for the death of Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We already we saw that gift of the Holy Ghost, right? Baptized into one body by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Come into the church, get rest, stay, you know, come come apart from all of the the sinners out there in society that are going to be judged and you along with them. Get out of that, get into the church, he's telling them. And with many other words did he, I already read that verse, verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. There were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They were gathered into his church. And guess what you do when you get into the church? You assemble together with it. Let me give you one. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. Paul here is exhorting. And who is he exhorting? Hebrews. Jews, right? The book is to the Jews. It is to the Hebrews. And what is he exhorting them to do? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Paul tells Jews who have been gathered into his church not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. Micah said, In that day, saith the Lord, I will assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. He took Jews from every nation under heaven that were driven out, gathered them together in his church where they assemble together. That's a pretty good fit to me, anyway. <clears throat> what is the noise that I keep hearing? I keep hearing something dinging. Anyway, uh, Micah 4 and verse 7. This is the last verse. And I will make her that halted a remnant. Actually, let me go back there. I want to get the whole thing. I just have that just a little part of it in the outline. Micah 4 and verse 7. And I will make her that halted a remnant and her that was cast far off, a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion forever, or from henceforth, even forever. So we're still talking about this halted remnant here. I will make her that halted a remnant. Well, we know that a remnant of the Jews were converted and became Christians, and that, that very word is used. He's going to make the halted a remnant. Look at Romans chapter 9, 27. Romans 9, 27. It says, Isaiah, that's Isaiah. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. So here you have Israel, the, the whole nation, and they're as numerous as the sand of the sea, so there's untold numbers of them. But only a remnant, only a small group of them is going to be saved. Micah said, I will make her that halted a remnant. So God's going to take out of that whole nation which most of which were wicked, but he's going to take a portion of them, a remnant out of them, and he's going to make them his remnant. Okay, They're going to be part of his church. 
Look at Romans 11, 1 through 5. Paul says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite <clears throat> of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What's the opposite of being cast away? Gathered, right? Assembled, brought together. He had not, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So in those days, back there in the days of Elijah, God had reserved 7,000 out of Israel that had not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. They were not idolaters like the rest. Now, 7,000 out of a nation that were, I don't know how many were in that nation at that time. When they came out of Egypt, I think there were 600,000. And I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, that was fighting aged men, 600,000 women and children. There were well over a million people that came out of Egypt well, Elijah was a long time after that, hundreds of years after they came out of Egypt. So there were, no doubt, millions of Jews at that time. And yet, out of millions, 7,000 the Lord had reserved unto himself that had not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. That's not very many. But then take it down to today. We've got 330-some million in this country alone. And now there may be churches out there, of course, that we don't know about. But how many true and faithful churches are there? Well, there ain't 7,000 of us, I can tell you that. Not that we're aware of anyway. I mean, there, I'm sure there's more, obviously, there's lots of God's elect out there. But how many you know, true and faithful churches are left? Not very many that I know of. If there were 7,000 of us out there, I'd be jumping for joy. That would be wonderful. Let's get the next verse, though. Verse 5. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So there's a remnant in Israel, a remnant that God would save. And of that saved remnant, there's a, like, almost a remnant within the remnant. There's a remnant of, of the saved that came into the church and that became Christians. And then there's some of them that didn't, right? They were broken off out of the olive branch. That's what Romans chapter 11 is about, that a lot of the Jews were, they lost their place in the church. But they could get it back if, if they continue not in unbelief, is what Paul goes on to say. So anyway, a remnant of the Jews were converted and became Christians. Now the repentant Jews that were halted were healed by Christ. Remember what he said there, that uh, I will make her that, Halted a remnant? Well, there were some of those halted Jews that, that were made to walk again, so to speak. Look at Matthew 13 and verse 15. Now, at first glance, you're going to look at this verse and say, wait a minute, this verse is completely contradicting what you just said. But I will explain why I'm using this verse. And then I think it'll be clear. Matthew 13 and verse 15. Jesus said, For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Now the people that he is referring to at that moment were not healed. right? Their eyes are closed, their ears are not open, they're not hearing and seeing, they're not being converted, and therefore they're not being healed. But the point is that if they would see and would hear and would be converted, they would be healed. Now, of course, there were plenty of people like his disciples, like the people on the day of Pentecost, plenty of Jews that were healed. But there were some, like he's talking about in this verse, peoples that hearts, people whose hearts were hardened, and the Lord had put them under a judgment so that they could not hear and believe. But my point is that the ones that do were healed. Right? He would make his halted a remnant. He would bring healing to them. Now, 
Jesus healed the brokenhearted. He preached deliverance to the captive. He, he set at liberty them that were bruised. Look at Luke 4, uh, 4 and verse 18. Luke 4 and verse 18. Jesus said, this is in his first sermon, when he goes to the synagogue and it was delivered unto him the book of Isaiah. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So he comes to his halted people and he heals them, just like he did Physically, in many cases, where people came to him that were crippled, that were blind, halt, that's what it says, halt, maimed, right? And he healed them. Well, he likewise spiritually healed his spiritually halting people and made them a remnant, brought them into his church. And then the second clause there in Micah 4, 7, and her that was cast off, a strong nation. So he's going to make his people that were cast off, he's going to make them a strong nation again. Now, once again, people would look at this passage and say, see, God's going to make Israel a strong nation again. And that right over there in the, in the Middle East, that's a fulfillment of God's promise. He's going to make them a strong nation. God didn't make them a strong nation. Number one, they're not even, most of them aren't even true Jews anyway, real Jews. But anyway, God didn't make them a strong nation. The United Nations made him a strong nation. The United States made him a strong nation. God didn't make him a strong nation. That, that nation over there is not of God whatsoever. They're a bunch of atheists, a bunch of antichrists. So how is it then that Israel was made a strong nation? Because they were destroyed in 70 AD, right? I mean, I'm telling you that, that in the first century, God made them a strong nation, and yet history says that they were obliterated off the face of the earth, that there was no nation there for a long, long time. Well, you got to look at it with the eyes of faith. you got to look at it in, 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 in light of what the Scripture teaches, okay? They were made a strong nation. They, along with the converted Gentiles, were made a holy nation. Look at 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. But a lot of dispensationalists and others, they miss this because they're thinking carnally. They're thinking of a physical nation. They're thinking of a physical kingdom. They're thinking of Christ down here on earth, sitting on a physical throne, reigning over a physical nation. And that's not what is happening. He's reigning from heaven upon David's throne right now. Anyway, look at 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. And I proved that extensively in the Millennialism series. You can go listen to that if you have questions about that. 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. It says, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Peter is the apostle to whom? To the Jews, right? He's writing to Jews primarily. He's writing to Jews that happen to be strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. 1 Peter chapter 1. He's writing to Jews then that were scattered over the world. They were then gathered into his church, assembled into his church. And we know they're in his church because the verse I just read there, 1 Peter 2, 5, he says that they are lively stones, build up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. They are made into God's house, right? God's church. Now, let's see about these people here that are assembled into God's church. What are they? Verse 9, 1 Peter 2, 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Now, he's only writing to the Jews who were converted, members of the New Testament church, and he says of them and any Gentiles that are in that church with them, of course, they are a holy nation. He's not talking to the nation of Israel at large, obviously. He's not talking to them at all. He's talking about people that are a spiritual house, and that is not the nation at large. 
So here he has, to his church that has been gathered and assembled, they're a holy nation. God said he would make her that was cast off a strong nation. Micah 4 and verse 7. They became part of the nation that God gave his kingdom to. Let's look at Matthew 21 and verse 43. Matthew 21 and verse 43. Let's just back up to verse 42. Jesus had just told this parable and the Pharisees realized that he, it was against them that they were going to be destroyed. They answered there in verse 41. You know, the, the man, they, he plants a vineyard and leaves it out to men and then they, they uh, abuse the men that he sent unto them and then he sends his son unto them and then they say, let's kill him and we'll be the heirs, right? And they, they realize, oh, yeah, we're, we're kind of seeing the writing on the wall here. We, we, we see what's going on. And, well, before, before they saw that, what's going on, they, they kind of stepped in it here in verse 41. And they say unto him, because he asked them, what's going to happen to those husbandmen? They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He's the stone they rejected. Now he's the head of the corner, right? The church is built upon him, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Verse 43, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So, Remember, the kingdom of God, prior to the coming of Christ, was the, new, the, the nation of Israel. It was God's kingdom, right? It was referred to as the kingdom of the Lord, right? It was God's kingdom. Well, then, when, when Christ comes, that kingdom then is taken from the Jews because they rejected Christ, and that kingdom is given to another nation, okay? Now, who's the other nation? Well, of course, there was no physical nation that the kingdom was given to, it wasn't the, you know, the, the nation of Syria or the nation, any of the, the nations of Asia or anything like that. The nation was the nation of God's people, Jews and Gentiles put together, right? Because the church, then God's people assembled together, they are the kingdom. They are that holy nation that Peter spoke of there, year and holy nation. The church is that holy nation. The Jews became part of that nation. They were made a strong nation joined together with the Gentiles. The Gentiles were brought into the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God transitioned over from being purely Jewish to Jew and Gentile and then to eventually mainly Gentile. That's the strong nation that they were brought into. And then the last clause here in Micah 4 and verse 7. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. So Jesus Christ would reign over them in his church, which is Mount Zion. Let me give you a couple of verses to prove that. First of all, he'll reign over them. Let's look at Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. It says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And the Lord shall reign over them. Well, right there it is. Jesus Christ reigning over over all principalities and powers, being head over all things to the church. And it says he shall reign over them in Mount Zion. Now, of course, the dispensationalists are going to say, yes, he's going to come back to Israel. He's going to be sitting in Israel. and He's going to be reigning over the nation of Israel in the land of Palestine. But once again, take off your carnal glasses, put on some spiritual glasses and read the Bible and look at Hebrews 12, 22 through 23, and see what Mount Zion is. Hebrews 12, 22 through 23. 
but ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. There's the Mount Zion that Christ is reigning from over his people. The heavenly Jerusalem. Right? He's reigning at the right hand of God over his church, which is spiritually Mount Zion. And it says there, he shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. And he will. He will reign over them, world without end. Amen. Ephesians 3 and verse 21. Ephesians 3 and verse 21. It says, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. He's going to reign over his church forever. Whenever he comes back, he's going to deliver up the kingdom. And then we're all going to be one big church all together. And he's going to reign over us forever. So let's just go back briefly and just hit the high points one more time. Just to, to make sure you got it solidly in your mind. Back there to Micah chapter 4. I'm glad somebody asked me this question because I think this is a fascinating passage and I'm really glad that I was able to, to be kind of not forced in a sense, but sort of forced. I had reason to look into it and to preach on it, which I hadn't had before. So, verse 1, last days, first century, the mountain of the house is established. God builds his church and his kingdom on this earth and the people flow into it. Jews from all over the place, right? Day of, day of Pentecost. Verse 2, many nations come. So you got Gentiles from all over the place. They come to the mountain of the house of the Lord. They learn the Lord's ways, right? They walk in his paths and the word of God goes out of Zion through the word of the apostles, through the epistles from Zion and Jerusalem. Right, so the word issues forth from his church, in other words. Verse 3, he judges many nations. The gospel goes out and calls men to repent. And it calls them to forsake their violence, to forsake their enmity against God, and forsake their enmity against each other. Jews and Gentiles are now brought at peace with each other. They beat their, plows into, uh, they beat their, beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Just one side note, uh, I think it was uh, Benjamin Franklin said that they that beat their swords into plowshares will, will plow for those who didn't. So, anyway, but that's a side note. They're not going to learn war anymore. No more hostility between Jews and Gentiles and between them and God. And then verse 4, they sit every man under his own fig tree and under his vine. They are brought in peace they are, they are given sustenance from God. He takes care of them. And now they're sitting and not, um, not warring, not fighting, not working anymore, so to speak. And then verse 5, you still have the unconverted Gentiles that are walking in the name of their God. But then you have God's converted Jews and Gentiles who are walking in the name of the Lord, their God, forever. Then verse 6, God assembles his halted and driven out and afflicted people. He, just kind of a recap, he brings his Jew, his, his people that had been afflicted, he brings them in to his church. And then verse 7, he makes her that was halted a remnant. And then he makes her a strong nation. He makes Israel what it once was, only spiritually so. They are spiritually a strong nation now because they're in God's kingdom, his spiritual kingdom, the church. And then he reigns over them from henceforth forever from Mount Zion, from the heavenly Jerusalem, from and for and by his church. <clears throat> 